We're talking with Barack Obama, author of Dreams from My Father, a Story of Race and Inheritance, published by Times Books. Welcome, Barack. Thank you very much. And I did say African American, and the fact that your father, who also was Barack Obama, uh, was from Kenya. That's right. He was uh, part of that first wave of young Africans who, uh, right after independence in the early 60s, came to the West in search of uh, education, hoping to master Western technology and bring it back to develop a modern Africa. And meet your mother at the University of Hawaii. Met my mother there. She was coming from uh, the opposite direction. Uh, An uh, American Caucasian. She was a, she, she was a, a, a white American uh, coming from a small, uh, a, a series of small towns in, in Kansas and Oklahoma. Um, I, my, I, I, I like to joke that uh, my grandparents on my mother's side uh, s uh, are stepping out of an American Gothic painting uh, because they're so prototypical average Midwestern uh, Americans. But they were also, especially Gramps, uh -huh. your grandfather, a liberal, uh, and so was Tutu. Right. Uh, they were exceptional people. In many ways, both your grandparents and your mother and father were part of that the 60s and the dream. Yeah, I, I really, and, and that's part of where I get the title from, Dreams from My Father. I think they were all part of a hopeful time. And I, and I think uh, when I say that my grandparents were prototypical, I think what they represented was the best uh, in sort of average American uh, life, sort of uh, decent people. Uh, they were liberal, but not in any ideological way. They just wanted to do the right thing. Uh, and in the early 60s, that mood of hopefulness, uh, an, an integrationist spirit, an, a, a notion that we could create a more just and equal nation where race issues would not matter and, and, and there was going to be harmony. I think uh, my entire family got swept up into that. Uh, unfortunately, the dreams began to uh, fray uh, yeah. both within my own family and, and within the country as a whole. When you are growing up in Hawaii, I was surprised that color would play such a bigoted part, especially at school. Right. Uh, Hawaii to me has always been what the epitome of a melting pot, right. and I, that was a really disappointing. Right. Well, you know, the, the I should say I think Hawaii is a wonderful place, and I think it it probably is as successful as any place in accommodating mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a multicultural uh, environment and, and and groups and races working together. Uh, but what happened when I was there uh, as a young person, as a child? Uh, is that the African American community there was very small. Uh, it was uh, uh, much smaller than it is now, for example. Yeah. And as a consequence, a lot of the, the, uh, the race uh, confrontations that ended up affecting me had more to do with uh, just pure ignorance uh, on the part of many of the people that I oh, met. Oh, but I said to you there was a moment that I found devastating reading that. Uh -huh. And that was the day your grandmother had evidently been hustled on the street right. and comes home and tells you and you hear her talking with your grandfather right. and what he finally says she didn't want to say it was a big black man right and it was as if suddenly your balloon fizzled well I, I think that's right I, uh, that was a, a, a powerful moment for me uh, because I think it represented uh, the notion that even within families that love each other, uh, and, and my grandparents, my grandmother uh, was, was extraordinarily loving, um, even within families of, uh, with the best intentions, uh, race can intrude in ugly ways. Uh, and that uh, uh, we can't escape sort of the, 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 the historical legacy uh, that this country has created, but uh, also ended up affecting my father uh, back in Kenya. Uh, you know, we have this uh, uh, difficulty in understanding the other. Uh, we're, we live as strangers, black and white. Uh, and although I think within my family and hopefully uh, through the journey that I record in the book, uh, a greater degree of understanding has arrived at, uh, I still think it's a, it's a difficult struggle. It had to be doubly difficult for you because you were moving between two families. Well, you know, the uh, uh, I did. My father had returned to Kenya mm -hmm. uh, uh, after uh, he and my mother separated. Uh, this is when I was only two years old, uh, and essentially, my father uh, 
became sort of a mythic figure to the me. The icon. Uh, an an yeah. icon. Uh, and my mother, who is just a wonderful, generous woman, uh, I tease her sometimes that uh, she was a proponent of uh, Afrocentric education before it became fashionable because she really uh, yeah. emphasized and built up a strong self-image uh, for me of what it meant to be an African uh, and an African-American, that I should be proud of that heritage and, and, and that culture. But nevertheless, it was extraordinarily difficult uh, to grow up in uh, both Hawaii and then later in Indonesia, yeah. uh, uh, where I was often the only uh, uh, person uh, of, of African extraction uh, there, and I did not have male role models, much in the same way that many young inner city kids uh, uh, these days don't have uh, role models that they can look up to. In some ways, the book is not unlike sort of a Jason the Golden Fleece, a Greek tragedy, in the sense that your father comes back once when you're 10. Right. And it is until years later that you learn the real story of what happened to him back in Kenya. Right. Where he goes back, works for an oil company, he's king of the hill, right. marries again, and then because he starts to speak up and because of the changing political scheme, right. he's from the wrong tribe. Right. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, he ends up uh, being blacklisted from the government uh, and uh, in fact dies a very bitter and lonely man. Uh, and uh, e there is a tragic element to that. And, and part of what uh, I had to come to terms with in writing the book uh, and in discovering that entire side of mm -hmm. my life and my family uh, was, to, was to, to really recognize that uh, uh, he had been shaped by uh, many of the forces that I ha was struggling with as a youth, uh, that uh, he, uh, as an African, uh, although was not genetically mixed, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, culturally was caught in this uh, cross-pollinization, this hybridization, this, this movement from uh, traditional African society into suddenly being catapulted into the modern age. And, and uh, I think in the end he was not ever quite able to completely bridge that, that, that schism between modern life and traditional life uh, that probably uh, is a schism that for him at least was just as powerful as any schism uh, between black and white. Yeah, because he really was going from what, almost the 1800s into uh, an advanced 20th century when he goes to Harvard That's for an exactly economics right. degree. Right. I mean, the, the leap that my father made uh, is, is just extraordinary. Uh, you know, and, and if you look just two generations back, uh, the leap that my grandfather made, uh, you know, my grandfather, I learn uh, mm -hmm. towards the end of the book, uh, uh, had, was the first person in his village to encounter uh, white people. Uh, and we forget sometimes in uh, American culture because uh, the black-white issue has been so long because slavery started yeah. so long ago and the slaving trade began on the West Coast uh, uh, very early. Uh, in many parts of East Africa, uh, the, there was very minimal contact between white and black until very late, so that my grandfather, who was born in 1895, uh, is, you know, uh, uh, is, is... It's like he went to the moon. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, suddenly he now has to, uh, uh, he comes, I tell a story about him uh, coming back from uh, in his encounters with white people and wearing Western clothes for the first time, uh, and uh, his father saying, uh, uh, you know, to, the, to his brothers, don't uh, touch this uh, this guy. Don't talk to him. He's unclean. Uh, and 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 those kinds of conflicts, where by the end of his life, he's now suddenly uh, looking and riding in airplanes and and uh, uh, riding in motor cars and right. The, the entire transformation that took place there, I think, was was powerful and difficult, and I think ended up shaping both my father's life and, as a consequence, my own. Talk about change, because it we'll s sort of jump over a little bit. Mm -hmm. You go to Occidental, you go to school, uh, college in New York. Right. But you end up in Chicago through the influence of a man named Marty. Uh, well, I, I call him Marty. That's, okay. a, that's a pseudonym. All right. right. Who brings you back to Chicago to teach you how to be a community leader. A community organizer. And, right. uh, well, I guess a leader organizer right. in that world. And how you got met, M-E-T, uh -huh. as the first sort of object for your group to say, wait a minute, here's where we attacked right. first. Right. Well, you know, the, uh, uh, I ended up 
uh, this was in the early 80s, I became a community organizer, and I think I was running counter to a lot of my generation who, uh, this was in the midst of the Reagan era, uh, and most of my contemporaries and classmates were going in the opposite direction to Wall Street and, and uh, thinking about uh, making money. And uh, I think the reason that I became a community organizer uh, was in part to try to re, uh, reestablish or, or connect with the, the dreams and the idealism that had brought my parents together. Uh, you know, uh, I, in my mind, uh, my identity was wrapped up with sort of images of freedom riders uh, in, in the South and, and uh, uh, kids marching for their freedom. And uh, I wanted to be a part of that because my sense was that by being a community organizer, you could bring together uh, the many disparate strands in, in, in America. Barack, there's a point in here where the people aren't going to stick with you. Uh -huh. And I wonder if you would read where you begin, let me ask you something and sure. down to here, no, because be it's as pertinent today. Okay. Um, just set the scene, sure. what's happening. Well, the context here is I've just arrived as an organizer, and I'm discovering suddenly that the organization's about to fall apart. This is in a low-income neighborhood uh, in Chicago. I'm working in public housing developments in Chicago. Uh, I'm very green behind the ears, and I'm a little shy, and I'm a little, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very inexperienced. And suddenly I find out that these leaders in this community, these low-income residents, uh, really want to quit the organization. Uh, and I'm sort of in a panic, and, <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what exactly uh, I should do. And so uh, this is my sort of first burst of anger at them, uh, which I think catches them by surprise. Uh, how far would you like me to go? Just to the bottom of that paragraph. Okay, there, good. Um, yeah. and, and essentially, uh, the conversation uh, goes something like this. Uh, uh, let me ask you something, I said, pointing out the window. What do you suppose is going to happen to those boys out there? Barack, no, no, I'm just asking you a question. You said you're tired the same way most folks out here are tired. So I'm just trying to figure out what's going to happen to those boys. Who's going to make sure that they get a fair shot? The aldermen? The social workers? The gangs? I could hear my voice rising, but I didn't let up. You know, I didn't come here because I needed a job. I came here because Marty said there were some people who were serious about doing something to change their neighborhoods. I don't care what's happening in the past. I, don't, I, I know that I am here now, and I'm committed to working with you. If there's a problem, then we'll fix it. If you don't think anything's happened after working with me for a year, then I'll be the first one to tell you to quit. But if you're planning to quit now, then what I want you to do is answer my question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, who are, who's going to take care of those boys? Who's going to take care of those boys? I mean, you know, that scene takes place where there are a, a bunch of kids right outside uh, uh, the office where I'm talking to these yeah. people, and, and uh, they're throwing stones. They're basically tearing down, uh, you know, the, the debilitating, demoralizing environment that's around them. Uh, you know, they're, they're pulling down uh, windows and, and throwing stones at, at uh, the, the doors, and, uh, and suddenly, you know, I get sort of an epiphany and see that uh, nobody's tending to them. And I guess, in part, I identify with these young men because they don't have fathers either and, and I'm thinking nobody's looking after them. Barack, you just said something about the men of your generation who graduated, who mm -hmm. went on to Wall Street. Right. Would they have, and we're going to take a short pause and maybe we come back, we can answer that. Would they have had that opportunity without affirmative action? And right. if they have lost their dream and their only object has been money, how will they react as affirmative action is being killed? Mm -hmm. We'll be back after a short pause. If anyone ever tells you that your thoughts aren't important, or that you're wasting your time, and if they tell you that you'll never make it, or that you dream too much, if anyone ever tells you you're too much anything, or not enough anything, but what they think means nothing. A message from the U.S. Navy, where we believe the only way to grow is to rise to the challenge. Okay, I know it's the law. I can read. Doesn't mean I have to agree with it. There's no way out, man. The risk is just too great. Are you sure it's on the list? It's not too hard to find out. Yeah, I know it's on the list. But it was legal to own when I bought it. 
then what's the big deal? Register it. You register your truck, don't you? If you register it, it's legal. If you don't, it can be a heavy fine or even jail time. Register it, man. Why make a legal gun illegal? Owners of legal assault weapons have been given a forgiveness period to register their weapons. The deadline is March 30th, 1992. Failure to register could mean a heavy fine or even jail time. So register your weapon. Why make a legal gun illegal? Hunters, shooters, flinkers, and others don't ignore the law. The deadline for registering legal assault weapons is March 30th, 1992. If you have questions, see your local gun dealer or call 1-800-499-GUNS. When he needed help, Easter Seals was there. When she felt alone, Easter Seals was there. For 75 years, the Easter Seal Society has had one mission, to help people with disabilities achieve independence. With each person comes a story, and to celebrate the special 75th anniversary, Easter Seals wants to hear your story. Call 1-800-STORIES by voice or TDD. Your call could make history. talking with Barack Obama, author of Dreams from My Father, A Story of Race and Inheritance, published by Times Books. Barack, before the break, I mentioned friends of your generation right. who, Wall Street, and we should tell our friends in the audience that you did take time away from Chicago to go to Harvard Law School, where you became president of Harvard Law Review. That's right. I hate saying first black, but it's in the book and uh, whatever, you were a leader who was elected. Right. You didn't go into Wall Street, you've gone back to Chicago right. and civic rights, civil right. rights. Right, You know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently a, 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 a practicing civil rights lawyer, uh, which means that I get involved in a whole range of different uh, issues uh, that touch on issues of race. Uh, you know, I do voting rights, um, I do employment discrimination law, well, NAACP Legal Defense Fund had really been one of the pioneers in that field. Right. Well, in fact, and we do some work with uh, with uh, LDF, uh, mm -hmm. certainly on voting rights as well as some of our employment discrimination uh, work. Well, you know, one thing that's interesting about the current debate surrounding affirmative action uh, is how little I uh, attention is paid to uh, the the difficulties in prosecuting. Uh, employment discrimination. If you listen to the debate, you would think that uh, uh, you walk into any major corporation, there are all these black folks there uh, doing great, and all these Latino folks are doing great, and Asian Americans are running everything. And, and the truth of the and matter is. And some of them are women. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the truth is, if you walk into these offices, that's not the case. And, and it's extraordinarily hard to bring employment discrimination suits just because generally uh, public interest firms are outmanned, outgunned in terms of the money and lawyers that can be devoted to these cases and and uh, the, the judiciary these days is not very sympathetic uh, to the, the, the cause of civil rights and so as a consequence part of the reason I think that I, I wrote the book and included those chapters you mentioned on, on community organizing uh, is that uh, uh, progress is probably not going to come through the courts these days. We're not going to see a Brown versus Board of Education uh, type of decision anytime soon. What we're going to have to do is to sort of uh, work at the grassroots level and the community level and also uh, rediscover some sense of mutual responsibility between uh, uh, black and white America uh, if we're going to make progress uh, into the 21st century. Isn't that wishful thinking? Because until economics are Liberalism seems to fly out the window when people are nervous about their economy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that I think that that is uh, uh, true. W what I do think, though, is that there is the possibility of building common ground uh, around an economic agenda mm -hmm. uh, that uh, would be good uh, for all people. And you know, the problem we have. Uh, and this is why the race card can always be played, is that basically we live uh, where blacks and whites are strangers to each other. We don't know each other's stories. We don't have a sense that uh, we have so much in common. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I tell an interesting story. Uh, uh, actually, it's not in the book, but, but when I got married, um, I invited Tutu, my grandmother, um, 
this little old white lady out to the south side of Chicago to, uh, to uh, my mother-in-law's house. And so my grandmother walks in, it's all black people in the room, and uh, she's you know the only mm -hmm. white person there except for my mother. Uh, and uh, she's feeling a little nervous and a little out of place, and she suddenly sees this table set with fried chicken and succotash and, and, and uh, uh, you know, a jello mold and, and all the things. And suddenly she realizes that, you know, she has a culture that she's sharing with all these people, just as her uh, grandson is now going to be uh, sharing a family with these folks. Uh, and, and there's a sense of recognition there. And, and I think that we can build uh, a progressive politics. Oh, there's a lovely scene at the uh -huh. wedding where she puts her arms around two of the children and said, well, you, these are my two new uh, sons or daughters right. there. Right. And th that's exactly yeah. right. And, and, and so, you know, when I see the progress that's made in my family uh, in terms of understanding, in terms of a spirit of, of uh, communion, uh, then I think that uh, the country can achieve that too. But I think you're right that at times of economic scarcity, um, generally uh, the politicians in this country right now uh, want to look for scapegoats, want to organize around race as opposed to around principle and around values. Uh, and I think that's a mistake, and I think that can be countered, but it's going to require the kinds of grassroots mobilization uh, and, and the kinds of work at a local level that I think uh, I talk about a lot in, in those chapters on Chicago. Wonderful man there, Reverend Wright. Right, and yeah. uh, who is, who is uh, my pastor, and uh, he is a wonderful man. And I think it, uh, that's an example of, uh, he's a pastor of a, of a large congregation in Chicago. And one of the interesting things that I discover in my journey to discover mm -hmm. what my identity is and who my father is, is, is also discovering sort of uh, my own faith, which, which is not uh, necessarily a traditional faith. I don't come out of an institutionalized religious setting, but uh, uh, what becomes important to me as I work with uh, churches in the mm -hmm. south side of Chicago and low-income neighborhoods uh, is to realize that you know all the stories and songs of the church, uh, you know the, the the hope that is embodied in yeah. the church, the, the the sense of of, of, of liberation that is embodied in the African, historically African American church uh, is really something that, that, that moves me deeply and I think uh, uh, is probably the main pillar around which a lot of inner cities uh, communities are going to be built. And Reverend Wright, uh, uh, my pastor who I, I speak about in a chapter in the book, I think represents the best of what uh, the black church has to offer. Barack, I ha can't escape without asking about the trip to Kenya. Right. And meeting all of the relatives, all your half brothers and sisters, right. and especially the wonderful sister, Alma. A.U. Alma. 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 Right. Who comes to visit you from having been studying in Germany. Right. And really is like you're uh, taking you into the dark of explaining your father to you. Well, that's right. Uh, she is, she's a wonderful sister and, and a wonderful character, I hope, in the, in, uh, in the book. I hope she comes across that way. Uh, she and I first make contact when she finally visits me in Chicago, and she basically uh, tells me the real story of what happened to my father uh, after he left us uh, and sort of punctures some of the myths yeah. that I've been carrying around about him. Uh, and I realized that uh, he had a tough time and that he went through the same struggles uh, as I did. And I think it was that meeting with her that then opens the door and allows me to return to Kenya uh, and finally fully embrace uh, that side of my family and, and to understand what uh, Even your older that country brother. is about. Uh, my older brother, Roy, uh, yeah. who, who we now call Abongo, he's, he's reasserted his, uh, his heritage. Uh, but uh, uh, both of them uh, teach me uh, about family and, and, and teach me what it means to, uh, to be a part of the African family. And even the African family, and we talk about America and economics, right. they were too the, the sort of the problems over your father's inheritance. Right. It is interesting how when the dollar comes in, mm -hmm. love can sometimes fly out. Well, I, th I, think, that's, I think that's right. And, and one of the things that I learned by going uh, back to Kenya and, and, and learning the story of my father and, 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 and grandfather is that uh, you know, we can't look at Africa through rose-tinted glasses. I mean, I think that the, uh, 
uh, there is good and bad in Africa. There are good and uh, there's good and bad in black folks, yeah. just like there's good and bad in, in white folks. And and what that does then is it gives us a responsibility. We have to choose uh, uh, what inheritance we want. Uh, is it an inheritance of money or is it an inheritance of values? And I I, I guess. Uh, I end up opting for the latter. And I look forward to speaking with you many more times, Barack. I had a wonderful time. This is only the beginning. Will you autograph I my will be book? happy to. And if you would like a copy of our publication, Good Book, send me a stamp, self addressed envelope to Good Books, P.O. Box 69, 1640, Los Angeles, California, 90069. Look for our column in California Press Bureau newspapers and support your local library. It is still our finest institution in America, and there's a place for everyone in the public library, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian. I had a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you.